Greetings and welcome to everyone to worship where you are a part of the Petoskey United Methodist Church. My name is Jerry Wheeler and I'm co-leader co -lay -leader with this church along with my wife who is, is my partner. We have been members of this church for over 50 years and have been quite involved over the years. I'd like to acknowledge all of our new worshipers today and also our everyday worshipers that we've had for years and, and years. We welcome each and every one of you and we're glad that you, you are here and may God bless you for being here. Remember now that through the six weeks of Lent, Pastor Nikki is hosting an online prayer time on Wednesdays at noon on the PUMC Facebook page. Take time out to join her this Wednesday at noon on the PMC, PUMC Facebook. Let us be in an attitude of prayer. Lord, we are here this morning, despite the many things that claim to our lives, our hearts and our spirits. Open our ears and our hearts to hear your healing words of love. Prepare us through worship, prayer, the reading of your holy scriptures, the preaching and the sacrament of Holy Communion to be faithful disciples in Jesus' name. Amen. The first lesson today is from Psalm 19. It reads as follows. The heavens are telling of the glory of God and a firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words, their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In the heavens he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his heavenly, his wedding canopy, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the ends of them, and nothing is hid from its, its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The decrees of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteousness altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servants warned, and keeping them there is great reward. But who can detect their errors? Clear me from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from the insolent. Do not let them have dominion over me then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This is the prayer of confession. Patient Lord, we have cluttered the temples of our lives with countless unnecessary things that have blocked your healing words of hope and mercy from others who also desperately need them. And our desire to make things easier and more economic for ourselves, we have made them more difficult and created barriers for others. Forgive us for our blindness to the separation we have caused. Forgive our willingness to seek perspectives outside of our own. And forgive our reluctance to seek and follow your counsel and guidance. Forgive us when we have been so preoccupied with our own economic concerns that we have failed to listen to your words and follow your ways. Clear away our fears and frustrations. Give us clean hearts and renewed spirits. Help us to anchor ourselves in your mercy and transformational love in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Rejoice. All is not lost. Let the clutter of your lives fall away. God is your guide and your deliverer. You are forgiven and restored by the love of God 
in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, sometimes we have difficulty hearing the story of Jesus cleansing the temple of those who would, in the desire to provide for themselves, block the way of others. We always want Jesus to be patient, meek, and mild. But there are many times when bold action is required to cleanse the blemishes of indifference from our lives. Lord, help us to remember that Jesus' patient words often fell on deaf ears. Remind us that we can also be bold in our faith. Remind us to examine the pain, greed, and fear in ourselves and repent of it. Replace our anxieties with confidence in your all-sustaining love and grace. Enable us to put our service to you and your people above our self-interest. As we reach out to others in need, remind us that we also stand in need of your grace and mercy. For we ask these things in the name of of your Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Our gospel lesson this morning is found in the Gospel of John, chapter 2, beginning at verse 13 and going through verse 23. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. 
In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, we have heard the words you've revealed to us in the scriptures. Let them fall upon and take root in hearts that are filled with compassion and mercy for all your people. Amen. So I am going to start today by asking you a pressing question. Are you more of a clutter bug or a neat freak? While you take just a minute and consider this question or argue with your spouse or loved one, go ahead and respond in the comments box below. And while you are figuring out your answer, I have a story to share. So about two weeks before Ash Wednesday, I woke up one weekday morning. I flung my creaky legs over the side of the bed. I stretched my arms. And I went to grab my glasses, which were not where I usually put them. Now, it's dark in my bedroom, so I realized Matt must have closed the bathroom door. No window light was leaking into the room. So, I slow shuffled across to the bathroom door, almost made it, but tripped on a shoe, my shoe. I made it into the bathroom, was washing my hands, knocked a bottle of my moisturizer off the counter into the trash, picked it up out of the trash. The countertop was crowded with a mouthwash bottle, moisturizer, toothbrush holder, makeup, etc. Again, I admit all my stuff. Then I headed downstairs after finding my glasses on the dresser by the door. At the front door, I tripped over a boot that had somehow walked to the center of the floor in the night. Again, my boot. I finally made it to the kitchen. Coffee cup. Coffee cup. My cup was still on the table from a late cup of coffee the day before. I grabbed the coffee cup, knock a stack of mail, again my mail, off of the counter. I go to sit in my chair and I have to move some books that I was studying from last night that were there. And this is about when I melted down. All this clutter, it's just too much. I can't even think in here. Like the super mature adult that I am, I stomped around the kitchen living and dining areas, cleaning off surfaces in such a huff that huffiness was actually going to be able to count for cardio that day. Now, 
Is anyone out there laughing because you know or because you can probably see this happening in your own thought bubble memories right now? So again, I ask you, are you more of a clutter bug or a neat freak? Does clutter regularly get in your way of doing what you set out to do? As I was researching today uh, for this week, I read an old article in Psychology Today by the title, Why Mess Causes Stress. Eight Reasons, Eight Remedies by Sherry Borg Carter. She's a psychology doctor. And here's what Dr. Carter says about clutter. She says clutter overstimulates us. It causes our senses to have to work overtime to process stimuli that aren't important. Clutter distracts us from our goal and our mission. Clutter tires our bodies and minds because in clutter we find it difficult to relax both physically and mentally. Clutter constantly signals to our brains that our work is never done. And clutter makes us anxious because we can't process what it will take to reach the bottom of our inbox. Clutter creates guilt and embarrassment, especially when others can see it. Clutter inhibits creativity and productivity by invading the open spaces for people to think, brainstorm, problem solve, and dream. Clutter prevents us from locating what we need quickly. So why am I asking you about clutter? Well, let me tell you why I'm asking this question. I want you to close your eyes, unless you're driving, for a minute, and I want you to imagine Jesus' thoughts as he walked into the temple. The place he would have walked into would have been the court of Gentiles. This is where non-Jewish worshipers would go to pray. This is where rabbis and the teachers of the law would have stationed themselves to answer people's questions about God. This was a place for people who didn't yet know God to seek him, to learn about him, to grow in understanding and curiosity as people of faith would bear witness to God's glory and grace. It was a place for people of all nations and races. It was the most diverse expression of the journey of faith. But you see, making the journey to the temple was not easy for everyone. Keeping animals spotless and without blemish along the way was even more difficult in the rocky, scrubby terrain. Out of convenience for those who could afford it, the people of that time created a marketplace so people could easily purchase such sacrificial animals as would be needed to visit the temple. After they got to the temple from traveling. Now they chose to set this place to purchase sacrificial animals just inside the gates in the court of the Gentiles, which preceded the court of the women, the court of Israel, the altar and the court of priests, then the Holy of Holies. What was happening was that the buying and selling of goods was crowding out the Gentiles, 
the people who were non-Jews that were coming to seek God. The purpose of coming to the temple in the first place was to worship God. But in service to themselves, the religious power brokers had turned a place that was supposed to be alive with diversity and seeking and questioning and growing into a marketplace for profit. So there is no wondering why when Jesus entered the temple, he was incensed. The people had lost their focus. The religious leaders had strayed from the mission. The place had lost its true purpose. The temple, all of it, was his father's house, designed as a place of worship where all who, seek, who were seeking God would find him. So naturally, when Jesus entered, he was irritated by what he was seeing. The high-ranking Jewish leaders were at the root, keeping people who weren't like them from seeking God, from deepening in their relationship with God. So in his displeasure with what was happening, Jesus overturned some tables. He threw the animals out. He ran the money lenders out. He entered the temple and he restored focus. We may not have money changers in the entryways of our churches today. But we can all admit that there are distractions, there's clutter that keeps people who are wanting to connect with God in the farthest area of the outer courtyards. So what are the distractions? What's the clutter that is before us today? One of the things that I've had a little bit of time to wrestle with during COVID is that in the midst of uncertainty, my routine has been uprooted, causing me to refocus. And so I've just been thinking, what keeps people outside of the church today? And when I say church, I don't necessarily mean the building but out of communities of people of faith who welcome the questioning and the growing and the learning and the knowing God. We look at people's perfect lives on social media and we wonder and we worry about the enoughs. As people enter a faith community, they wonder, Am I holy enough? Can I ever be holy enough? Am I righteous enough? Am I worthy enough to enter into this sacred community or space? They wonder, do I know enough? Can I learn enough? These are people who have been rooted in their faith, some since birth. Will I ever be able to catch up? Am I strong enough? Am I committed enough? Am I committed enough or strong enough to let this community who follows Jesus Walk beside me and let the love of Christ change who I am today. Am I dressed well enough? Do I pray eloquently enough? Am I ready enough? And then we have 
other clutter that hangs out in the front courtyard. We have arguments and divisions that people have to trip over in order to get in. Conservative, liberal, LGBTQIA, straight, married, divorced. What race? What nationality? Do I wear a mask? Do I believe in social distancing? Can I hug? Do I like organ or piano or guitar? Contemporary or traditional worship? I seriously wonder what Jesus would think if he were trying to get into the church today to worship his Father and to lead others to him too. Might he turn tables over now as well? If Jesus entered the temple and he refocused the people, why do we meet together every week? What is the purpose for our gathering in front of our screens or in person when we are able to be together as church families? Why do we all come together like this? Why are we here? The answer, friends, is to worship God. To pray together for our community and the whole world. To help and encourage one another in our faith, to share a life of faith together, to be in fellowship with others who are seeking to live lives close to God, seeking to follow Jesus. The other stuff, it's clutter. And Jesus comes to stand among us, chest heaving in frustration at our desire to pile stuff in front of people to keep them out of his father's house. My friends, if our mission is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world, and our way of going about it is to love God with all our hearts, our mind, our soul, and our strength, and to love one another as we would love ourselves, then I'm thinking we ought to start cleaning up some clutter. We should keep the main thing the main thing. Keep our focus on loving God and loving others as we love ourselves, giving others the grace that we accept that God has given to us. Judgment is way beyond our pay grade. Judgment is for God. Our call is to love as we were loved before we even knew we needed God's love in the first place. Friends, we are going to gather at the table here in a minute. A table that is God's table. And here's the thing. If you are with us in worship, then you were invited to this table by God. This is a divine invitation you are accepting. At this table, we are all guests. And our host is the one who threw the stars into the sky and painted 
the dots on every ladybug. The one who made you, you. The one who made me, me. The one who made us, community. So as we partake of this meal, remember that at this meal where we receive more than bread and juice, this is a meal where we receive the grace of God through his son, Jesus, the Christ. In this meal, we are forgiven, we are redeemed, and we celebrate the hope of life everlasting. Amen. Christ invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You brought all things into being and called them good. From the dust of the earth you formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. When rain fell on the earth for forty days and forty nights, you bore up the ark on waters and saved Noah and his family and made covenant with every living creature on earth. When you led your people to Mount Sinai for forty days and forty nights, you gave us your commandments and made us your covenant people. When your people forsook your covenant, your prophet Elijah fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and on your holy mountain, he heard your still small voice. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, when you gave him to save us from our sin, your Spirit led him into the wilderness where he fasted 40 days and 40 nights to prepare for his ministry. When he suffered and died on a cross for our sin, you raised him to life, presented him alive to the apostles during the 40 days, and exalted him at your right hand. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. Now, when we, your people, prepare for the yearly feast of Easter, you lead us to repentance for sin and the cleansing of our hearts, that during these 40 days of Lent we may be gifted and graced to reaffirm the covenant you made with us through Christ. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread. He gave thanks to you and broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which I have given for you. 
Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has, has died. died. Christ, Christ is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will, will come, come again. again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and of the cup. Let them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And though we are separated and in our homes, we see what is before us as one loaf, and we, who are many, are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break is the sharing in the body of Christ. And the cup over which we give thanks, no matter where we are, is a sharing in the blood of Christ. The table is ready. You may serve one another in love. Jerry. Okay. The body and the blood of Christ are given for you. Pastor, the body of Christ and the blood are given for you. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So I leave you with two questions. What keeps people from encountering God? What keeps us from encountering God outside the church?
what clutter is in the way. Receive this blessing. Go out in peace. Go out and explore the wide open spaces of your faith. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.